As of March 27, 2023, CITES has banned all imports and exports of species from Mexico. This means that no CITES species can be imported into the U.S. or other countries from Mexico without the risk of enforcement. And this does not just apply to tarantulas and other invertebrates, but any species that is protected by CITES. This isn't an FWS policy per se. Obviously, United States Fish and Wildlife Service is the one implementing this, but this direction actually came directly from CITES. So it's not like FWS just decided to say, hey, we're going to stop allowing people to do business with Mexico. This actually came directly from CITES. First, let's understand what CITES is. CITES stands for the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora and remains one of the cornerstones of international conservation. It is an international agreement between governments aimed at ensuring that international trade in specimens of wild animals and plants does not threaten their survival. There are 184 member parties, and CITES works by regulating and monitoring trade in over 38,000 species of animals and plants, including spiders and scorpions. This could potentially have a major effect on the tarantula hobby, in particular for these species that can no longer be imported into the U.S. from Mexico. Most notably, this will include the Antilles pinkto tarantula, the Mexican Golden Red Rump, the Mexican Fire Leg, the Mexican Red Leg, the Mexican Red Knee, the Curly Hair Tarantula, and the Mexican Red Rump Tarantula. as well as others. It is important to note that this import-export ban is not on Mexican species, but on species that are being shipped from Mexico that are protected by CITES. So even if it was a postal etheria species that was not protected by the ESA, which is the Endangered Species Act, and that's something completely different, this would be a tarantula like the postal etheria metallica. If the P. metallica was bred in Mexico, it could not be shipped from Mexico to the United States or any of the other nations that are part of CITES. You're not gonna be able to get animals or any type of animal or plant products if that species is regulated by CITES or listed under CITES under any appendix, you're not going to be able to get that from Mexico. But if a CITES protected species, even if it's native to Mexico, was bred in another country like somewhere in Europe, they can still be imported into the United States just as long as that shipment did not originate from Mexico because the ban implicitly prohibits re-exportation. So you can't export these species from Mexico to another country and immediately redirect that to the United States. As Phil from US Arc explains, this move was made by CITES for a very particular reason, and it may only be temporary. This is kind of an unintended consequence. So the backstory on this is that the CITES convention, which is almost all the countries in the world, you know, are parties with CITES, and CITES secretariat and the decision makers at CITES were not happy that Mexico was not taking action to help protect the vaquita porpoise, which is a super cool mammal. It's the smallest cetacean, smallest porpoise on the planet. So actually, again, we're seeing a lot of unintended consequences because CITES is not happy that Mexico is not protecting the vaquita as much as it should be. And the vaquita, unfortunately, is another unintended consequence. There's a rare fish, well now rare fish, called the totoaba, which is similar to the situation we have with ivory. So these fish, the totoaba, are killed and all that's harvested from the animal is the swim bladder. It's used in traditional Chinese medicine, and these fish are targeted just for the swim bladder. So you'll find the rest of the fish, you know, discarded. And unfortunately, that small porpoise is caught up in that. And there's illegal fishing, which is actually on the north end of the Gulf of California, which is right underneath Arizona and Southern California. Again, CITES is not happy that Mexico isn't taking the action that CITES wants to see to protect this porpoise. Uh, some studies show that there may be as few as 10 or a dozen of these animals left in the wild or in the world period. So obviously it needs protection, but then what we're seeing is because CITES wasn't happy with the lack of protection on this porpoise, that everyone else is being affected by this. Hopefully Mexico is gonna address it. I believe that Mexico has already sent representatives over to Geneva to try and clear all this up. So hopefully this won't last very long, but again, I'm just speculating on that point. Whether this lasts for a few weeks, a few months, or a few years, it does highlight a serious issue within our hobby that needs to be addressed and resolved. And that is our over-reliance on the import of species into the hobby to fill the demand for tarantulas that are kept as pets here in the United States. A lot of the hobby states 
staples, or species that we really like to keep as pets, tend to be bred in Mexico and Europe and imported into the United States. And while there are a lot of breeders in the US, both hobbyists and commercial, there simply aren't enough people breeding tarantula scorpions and other invertebrates to meet the demand created by the growing tarantula hobby. And there are many reasons for this, as Andreas from 8 Paul's Tarantulas explains. I don't really import spiders and I tend not to buy imported spiders. I usually buy from hobbyists or other breeders because we, most of the stock that we have in the US, I feel like it's sufficient. The public tend to want kind of the same species. Most of the hobbyists are beginners and I feel like we don't have many breeders. So the species that go most are always the Arizona Blonde, the Mexican Red Knee, the one that people advise for, for beginners. And those always come from wildcat because nobody wants to breed them and raise them. They are a fairly cheap species, again, because of the imports and they are born so tiny and they take so long to grow that nobody wants to really raise them or sell sling. Everybody wants to sell big adults caught in the, in the wild. So many dealers rely on imports from other companies to keep their stock up to meet the demand that they see on their websites. And every year, it gets more and more difficult to import species into the United States, whether it's because of CITES protections, the Endangered Species Act, or the Lacey Act. While organizations like US ARC lobby the government on the local, state, and federal levels, as well as fight legal battles in court to protect our rights as keepers, the trend to drastically eliminate the amount of animals that are imported into our country gets more extreme every year for a variety of reasons. One thing we can do as hobbyists is to help alleviate the reliance on imports from other countries by putting in a lot more effort into ethical captive breeding here in the United States. Now, not everyone is interested in breeding. I have avoided it myself for many years, but issues like this are becoming more and more common. So I've recently changed my attitude on breeding and I've begun working with some local breeders here in, in my area who can help guide me on my journey to learn how to breed tarantulas as ethically and responsibly as possible so that I can breed some of the species that I have here in the collective. I still have no interest in becoming a dealer or selling tarantulas retail, but I have worked out arrangements with some other dealers who will buy any egg sacs that I produce at wholesale so they can sell them through their websites. If we work together as a hobby, there are many things we can implement that will help dealers and breeders in the invertebrate community source the specimens they need without having to rely so heavily on imports. Currently, a lot of breeders rely on Facebook groups like Spender to help find males for the species that they want to breed, and keepers can post mature males they have available for anyone breeding breeding that species. But that is not the most effective way this can be done, especially considering Facebook's policy on live animal sales and trade between individuals. This kind of group always runs the risk of violating the terms and services and being taken down permanently. Other ideas might be for breeders to have a most wanted list that they post on their website, so keepers that end up with a mature male can look at their favorite dealer's website and see if they're in search of that male for a breeding project they're working on. Or even better, we could develop a website or an app where people can post what males or females they have available for breeding, and species and availability can be easily searched. COVID taught us all an important lesson about the fragility of supply chains during unprecedented circumstances, and the need to be self-sufficient and able to create the supply we rely on within our own borders. This doesn't just apply to microchips and medicine, but to invertebrates and other animals as well. As the hobby grows, which it's been doing at an exponential rate year after year, the demand for these amazing species will continue to increase. This will make some species more difficult to obtain as well as possibly more expensive. But we can all work together to help alleviate the reliance on imports from other countries and help lower the price of many of these species by practicing ethical breeding here in the United States and supporting breeders and dealers that focus on carrying as many captive bred specimens produced here in the States as possible. This will also make a huge difference in the amount of wild caught specimens that are being ripped from their native habitats just to be sold in the pet trade. As Tom Saxon from Fangs TV explains. Honestly, what can people in the United States do to help out breeders. One of them is they really should start appreciating the, the spiderlings, right? So a lot of the Mexican species, they start off very tiny. We're talking about like the 0.33 inch size. The great thing is they're very hardy species. So they're used to arid conditions. They can tend to be a little bit food shy, right? So I, I tend to feed a lot of my early babies like pre-killed animals and they do very well on that. They hold the moisture. They have very slow metabolism, obviously. So feeding wise, you don't have to be as 
is kind of helicoptering. You know, you could go a, a week or two or three uh, without them eating and they're perfectly fine. They're very hardy, kind of bulletproof species. You know, if I had an egg sack of, say, 500, I, I'd be hard pressed to say that maybe 10 or 20 wouldn't make it out of that 500, you know, by the point of they all found different homes. They're, they're very hardy species. So what that does in terms of helping a breeder is it encourages me to breed more, right? If I bred all these species and they just kind of sat in my home forever and, you know, people wanted to wait till they were two inches and I was raising them up for years and years, uh, sure, I could charge more. But does that interest me in doing that in the future, right? Do I want to breed them again and then be like, okay, great, I just signed on for another three years of raising these species? That makes it a little bit harder. Trying to make sure that supply and demand are kind of equaled out. But I think in general, if people were just a little bit more comfortable with smaller spiderlings, that definitely helps out, you know, me as a breeder. In the short term, keepers here in the United States may need to get over our hesitation about raising tarantulas from spiderlings. So even though this current ban on imports from Mexico may only be temporary and is regulated to just one country, issues like this are happening more and more often. Every year, it will become more difficult and more expensive to import species into the States and possibly other countries as well. So it is integral that as a community, we begin to invest much much more time and effort into responsible captive breeding of tarantulas and other invertebrates within our own borders. This way, any legislation or acts that prohibit or complicate the importing of animals will not have as detrimental an effect on the hobby and our abilities to keep these species proliferating in captivity. Having a self-sufficient breeding program in our respective countries will not only help the hobby, but will keep these amazing species around for generations to come, even as their native environments in the wild are being systematically destroyed through deforestation, farming, and urban sprawl. So let's all do our part and support our local breeders and dealers and keep these species thriving no matter what the future will hold. If you want to stay up to date on any threats to your rights to keep these animals as pets, make sure you're following US Ark on social media and subscribe to their YouTube channel. And as always, I appreciate you watching. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thanks for buying Tarantula Collective merchandise and I will see you next Tuesday. <laughs>